conference. Uh, we are here today to talk about the introduction of my bill to end prohibition uh, in Pennsylvania, specifically prohibition on marijuana. Um, like the original prohibition, mar uh, the prohibition of marijuana has resulted in uh, damages far in excess of what the actual substance we're controlling could ever do. Um, this is a cruel, irrational policy that we've had for 75 years without revisiting. Marijuana was originally made illegal not because of health concerns, but because of economic interests of competitors of marijuana in a variety of contexts. And for the last 75 years, we've been treating people who smoke a plant as criminals. We've been treating them as uh, people who deserve a criminal record. Often the loss of freedom, the loss of a career, the loss of an academic career. Um, and these are people who've done no harm to any other person. They've done no harm to property. They've breached the peace in no way. It is irrational in a lot of different levels. It is irrational because there are other intoxicants which are far worse that we do not treat the same way, that we do not accuse people of criminal offenses for, for consuming. For example, we have alcohol and tobacco. Now, I'm going to go through this very briefly, but I do want to say to begin with that no rational society, starting from scratch, if we were starting today and going forward, you guys can stand in the picture, uh, um, it, it, with, going forward, starting from scratch, we would never have the policy we have now um, for a variety of reasons. Um, Marijuana is less dangerous than alcohol and tobacco, and let me be specific. Marijuana is not physically addictive. Alcohol and tobacco are physically addictive. If you stop using them after becoming addic addicted, you suffer physical withdrawal symptoms that you do not suffer uh, if you smoke marijuana, even if you smoke it a lot. Uh, some people say you can become psychologically addicted, but that does not result in physical withdrawal symptoms. It results in missing a product, but that is not the same thing. There was no lethal dose of marijuana. You could sit down and drink 10, 20 shots, and you can overdose and you can die. It happens all the time in fraternity hazing incidents. There's a number of famous uh, movie stars and other entertainers to whom that has happened. They just literally sat down and drank themselves to death. You, it's physically impossible to overdose on marijuana and, and, and have a, a fatal uh, situation. Cigarettes. Cigarettes kill 1,100 Americans every single day. Uh, and really horrible deaths from lung cancer and emphysema uh, and related illness, illnesses. Uh, marijuana could, does never and could never come close to doing anything like that. There are some evidence, we have some medical uh, 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 testimony here today that talks about this, but uh, there's some evidence that marijuana does, has no link to any of uh, these diseases at all, but even to the extent that it would, there would be a danger in smoking a marijuana cigarette. Um, most people who smoke marijuana do not smoke the way they smoke cigarettes. You do not smoke 20 or 40 or more marijuana cigarettes a day as cigarette smokers do. It can never have the kind of adverse effect on the health of Americans that tobacco has. Um, then there is the cost. We are spending about $350 million a year in Pennsylvania arresting, incarcerating, prosecuting, monitoring 25,000 people a year, approximately, for marijuana offenses. Disproportionately, these people are people of color and people of poor economic means. That is uh, a money we can no longer afford to spend. Beyond that, there is additional money, a lot of additional money, that we are leaving on the table as a society by forcing marijuana to be sold in an untaxed, unregulated black market. Uh, there have been a number of studies and a number of articles. There was a recent article by a Harvard economist that talked about nationwide, there's not a specific Pennsylvania uh, article on this, $100 billion a year in tax money and in ancillary industries that could be created by this law. We are leaving all of that on the table, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars a year, in addition to what we are spending uh, prosecuting people for doing this. Um, uh, additional... Uh, aspects of this that, that come up in these debates and I thought we would at least discuss. Some people say, and I'm going to address some of the arguments against this, some people say, and Governor Corbett said, well he doesn't support this because he believes it's a gateway drug. Now, I'm going to discuss the gateway drug issue. I'm going to discuss the gateway drug issue in a second, but regardless of that, I hope that we can all agree on one thing, that no matter what, how we feel about this issue, that we should decide this issue based on actual facts, not beliefs, 
But actual facts, as demonstrated in empirical studies, peer-reviewed studies, and actual experience by people who deal with this. If you do that, you will see that marijuana, there is absolutely no evidence that marijuana is a gateway drug. In fact, all of the evidence is to the contrary. First of all, as we were talking backstage, and there will be more discussion of, it's, there's, it's highly dubious that there are gateway drugs. There are gateway environments, and the fact is that by forcing people who use marijuana to go to black markets and forcing them to smoke marijuana uh, in, in environments where they have to be secret for fear of being arrested, we put them in an environment uh, where they can be exposed to other drugs. When you, when you go buy a bottle of Grey Goose at the state store, it's very unusual for the guy behind the counter to say, you know, I also have cocaine if you would like some. However, when you smoke marijuana and you buy it from a, a guy behind the bowling alley, and I'm, I apologize to the bowling industry in advance, you know, that situation is much more likely to occur. But what do the facts say? There was a recent study at Yale said 34% of people who used harder drugs, heroin, uh, meth, drugs like that, have previously used marijuana. <coughs> now, first of all, I would say 100% of people who use those drugs have previously had milk. So whether or not that is a, uh, there's a causation argument to be made is very dubious. But what that study also said is, while it's 34% for marijuana, 56% for alcohol. 56% of people who use harder drugs you have previously used alcohol. And 57% have previously smoked cigarettes. So if marijuana is a gateway drug, it is a really weak and ineffective gateway drug compared to these other drugs, which we not only legalize, but we glamorize, subsidize, and in the case of alcohol, actually sell. I mean, you know, keep, keep in mind, the governor has a proposal to dramatically increase the number of outlets that are selling alcohol around Pennsylvania, while he wants to continue to keep people in, 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 in prison or in threat of prison for marijuana. Uh, it, there is just no rational reason to do that. Um, the better way to look at the gateway drug effect is this. Well over 95% of people who use marijuana never use harder drugs. And again, the people who do use harder drugs are far more likely to have used the drugs that we legalize and glamorize in Pennsylvania. And so, based on that empirical data, the idea that we should continue prohibition because of it's a gateway drug just does not withstand scrutiny. I would also note that our policy does a number of very unfortunate things. As I said, it, requ it requires people who smoke marijuana to buy it illegally from criminals in, in, in environments that are not safe. No one ever dies, as I said earlier, from a marijuana overdose, but people do die from smoking marijuana that's been laced with PCP or that's been laced with other dangerous chemicals. Again, that used to be the case under the old prohibition with alcohol. People died all the time because they were drinking alcohol that was made in some guy's bathtub in his backyard. But that's not the case anymore. You go to a state store, you buy a bottle of whatever your favorite brand is, uh, and you know what you're getting. You know it's potency, whether it's beer, it's wine, it's hard liquor, it's uh, grain alcohol. You know the potency, and you know what you're getting is safe. You know what it's, it is, what it says on the bottle. We force people, especially young people, to buy it from criminals where they can be faced, they don't know the potency of it, and they can be faced with the possibility that it's been laced with other chemicals that could do them a great deal of harm. Uh, under my bill, that would no longer be the case. I would also say, that one of the unfortunate side effects of prohibitions everywhere is the violence that occurs when you create an artificial black market. During prohibition in the 30s on alcohol, we had Al Capone, we had Lucky Luciano, we had the Valentine's Day Massacre. We had people shooting each other in the streets over alcohol turf wars. We no longer have that. We have Super Bowl commercials by Budweiser and by, uh, you know, makers of, of, of uh, hard liquor. We, we, we no longer have violence associated with that industry. Similarly, our demand uh, in America, based on the illegality and the prohibition for illegal black market marijuana, is creating all kinds of car uh, issues involving drug cartels. Uh, people are being killed on both sides of our border with Mexico. It is a tragic, immoral situation, which is being perpetuated by prohibition. So I am introducing this bill, we believe by the end of the day, may uh, maybe as late as tomorrow morning. Let me go down very briefly what it does, and I'll introduce some of my guest speakers, and then we will take any questions anyone has. This bill would legalize marijuana 
for all purposes, medicinal, uh, recreational, whatever you want to use it for. Um, however, it would only legalize it for people over 21. In fact, it would treat marijuana almost exactly like alcohol is treated in Pennsylvania. You would have to be 21, uh, it, would be a, it would be illegal to have it or possess it or use it if you're under 21 years old. Um, there would be, it is illegal now to, to drive a vehicle while uh, under the influence of marijuana. It would be illegal can, still to drive a vehicle while under the influence of marijuana. There's a smoking ban in place where you can't smoke cigarettes in restaurants where it would bother other people. You would also not be allowed to smoke marijuana in restaurants where it would bother other people. There are many places you cannot drink alcohol in public. You also similarly cannot smoke marijuana in public. Um, and what I would do is initially, and there's a bunch of different ways to do this, and we see other states doing this as well. Just recently, Colorado and Washington, the people of those states voted to get rid of prohibition in those states. In California, prohibition's largely been gone de facto for a long time. And more and more places around uh, the country and around the world are going in this direction. Um, the, the, but, so what, this, what my bill would do would say that um, you would buy it in a state store. Um, and the reason I chose that, at least initially, is because we already have an infrastructure of, a, of, a, of, a, of facilities that are around the state that are used to checking ID, that are used to dealing with intoxicants, that are used to collecting taxes, and doing all the things that you would do with marijuana legislation. Um, and so we would sell the state stores, and of course it would be regulated, and the potency and all of that would have to be disclosed just like it is uh, with alcohol. You would also be allowed, like you are in Pennsylvania, to make your own beer and make your own wine. You'd be allowed to grow a limited amount of marijuana, six plants, three flowering at one time. Um, you could transfer, just like you could give away uh, alcohol, but you can't sell it. You would be able to transfer up to an ounce to another person who was over 21 years of, old, of age, but not for money. You would only be able to do it for free. You could not resell it. Um, and, you know... It's important that we, we, we look at this, the issues here um, in terms of the empirical data, the facts, the evidence, and not based on, you know, old wives' tales, not based on movies like Reefer Madness, you know, which were propaganda films that are comical in their inaccuracy. You know, as I've said before, some people have the image of marijuana, someone smoking marijuana is looking like Jimi Hendrix. They're more likely to look like Dick Cheney now. Uh, executives, middle-aged folks who are not home and should not be treated as criminals. And I would finally say that, you know, people ask me about the politics of this. In the short term, it's a tough slog. But long term, and not that long, it's inevitable. It's inevitable for, for, for three reasons. Number one, demographics. If you talk to young people now, liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, it doesn't matter, they have very little interest in continuing prohibition. They see the harm that this does. And over time, that will tell. Number, uh, number two is exposure. As we see what happens in Colorado and Washington and all the other states that are going to follow them very soon, we will see the benefit that there, there are only benefits. There are no downsides to this. And number, and number three, frankly, is finances. You know, 40 years ago, there was one place in America to gamble, um, which was Las Vegas. It was a huge thing. Now we have gambling in 48 states. I live a mile from a casino now. Because eventually people saw there's so much money to be made in, in doing that and so much money to be saved in not prosecuting it that it just doesn't become financially sustainable in a time of very tough budgets to continue to do this.